Hola, buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, vamos a ir comenzando, que hoy es un día muy largo, lleno de presentaciones y actividades. Eh, vamos a necesitar unos, unos auriculares para, para COVE. Mm. Bueno, de momento voy a comenzar con, con la presentación y también un poco enlazando con, con la jornada de, de ayer eh, en la que estuvimos eh, poniendo aprueba eh, el concepto de, de las jornadas. ¿no? Eh, eh, comentaba ayer que, que bueno, en el propio texto eh, introductorio y el concepto de las, de las jornadas eh, está sin resolver ¿no? y, y me interesaba que las, que las propias jornadas eh, pusieran a prueba incluso eh, con la posibilidad de, de fallar el concepto mismo y, y bueno creo que poco a poco se está como articulando desde el propio hacer ¿no? desde el propio estar y, y a través de los sobre todo a través de los materiales eh, fílmicos que, que estamos viendo y, y también de los talleres ¿no? también comentar que ayer estuvimos centrados como ¿no? como en las metodologías artísticas ¿no? y desde ahí intentar pensar eh, eh, bueno, eh, los conceptos que hemos trabajado en las jornadas. Y el día de hoy, eh, de alguna manera, también continúa con esa lógica, eh, sobre todo con la presentación que, con la que abrimos eh, el día de hoy, la presentación de Kobe Macis. Eh, Kobe Macis es, eh, bueno, lleva un, una organización cuyo nombre es Agencia, eh, y que tiene sede en Bruselas y es una organización creada en 1992. Agencia es un, una lista de cosas, un, un archivo eh, que de alguna manera todas ellas resisten las, categoriz las categorizaciones binarias eh, del, la, del pensamiento del o de la estructura occidental, ¿no? basadas en la división, por ejemplo, entre cultura y naturaleza, creación y hechos, sujeto-objeto, eh, humano y no humano, individuo y colectivo. ¿no? Y estas cosas eh, provienen, de hecho, de procesos judiciales, ¿no? eh, procesos judiciales que, de alguna manera, están relacionadas con controversias relacionadas con la propiedad intelectual. Eh, también mencionar que, eh, bueno, Kobe y yo nos conocemos eh, previamente, hemos trabajado juntos, eh, él participó en la exposición eh, que comisaría junto a mis compañeras de Buleguas en Bakibarik el contrato y allí eh, una de las de los invitados fue agencia y también desarrollamos una asamblea que es una de sus metodologías artísticas que en esta situación no no hemos podido eh, realizar, pero sí que realizó una asamblea en unas jornadas previas aquí en el K2M. Y, sin embargo, eh, me interesaba volver a invitar a, a, a Agencia, porque una de esas cosas, eh, muchas de, algunas de las cosas de la lista, justamente son cine eh, y eh, el formato de, de hoy va a ser una conferencia, no es una asamblea, pero vamos a examinar una de esas, de esas cosas de la lista de agencia. Muchas gracias, Kobe. Y deciros que el título de la, de la conferencia es Asamblea, pantalla blanca o negra. Uh, thank you, Elera, for this um, introduction. Also, thank you um, for the invitation. Um, I will talk in English, and thank you for the people who will be translating. It won't be very easy, because I'm basing myself on an English uh, um, legal document, so, but they have a copy of the text, and I hope it works. Um, The case I would like to invoke is thing 1504 on the list of things from agency. And it's about a film called So Is Your Uncle, of which, and a particular sequence, which I have some stills here in the back. 
maybe I want to say that I would like to invoke this thing more as a tool, as, as a kind of an actualization of a situation of the past, uh, in order to kind of address the ecology of a practice that's been under stress um, in Hollywood, and it's mostly the, the, the ecology of sla slapstick uh, movies. But I, I like to look at it more as a, as a possibility in becoming, not so much in terms of a loss of this uh, slapstick. I will try to go and explain the, the controversy in the beginning, and then we will read fragments from the actual legal uh, judgment. And that a judgment is a very technical text, it's, so it's going to be an exercise of trying to decipher, and I hope you can uh, cope with that. So also please interrupt me and uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. These texts are really difficult. Even I, I have to ha kind of really um, wrap my mind over it many times. I'm, I don't have a legal training. Um, but I have a kind of joy in reading those because I think the ecology of a practice is coming to its surface in these kind of um, legal documents. Um, and then I, I hope there's still time to discuss this, this uh, case. Um, the idea of like, or the aim of revisiting a court case is, is not so much in like to reenact a judgment but on, on uh, rather like to prolong its moment of hesitations. Like in the jurisprudence, there is the juris, but also the prudence, meaning to be like careful not to judge. And, and I think this moment of doubt or hesitation allows like uh, dwelling on a problem in a, in a more slow way. So I hope um, it will stay within the hour that is foreseen. Um, if not, please stop me. So, are there questions so far? No? So I propose we start. I, I gave everyone a copy because, like I said, this juridical text <clears throat> is extremely hard to follow. So it's much easier if you can read along. Um, It's a controversy that situates itself in the kind of change in very early Hollywood time, in the change of like slapstick movie more towards a narrative movie, and it's also the kind of moment of the change of the silent movie towards the sound uh, movie. And I'm going to show two clips of two films. Um, as I cannot show the whole film, I will try to um, <clears throat> summarize the story briefly. Um, but we'll see kind of two clips of a, a few minutes from those both uh, films. But first, I will try to introduce the film and explain a little bit the story so that you know in which uh, part you enter in the film. So in 1932, Clyde Brookman <clears throat> directed the film Movie Crazy for Harold Lloyd Corporation. In the film, the actor Harold Lloyd plays Harold Hall, a young man with little acting experience who desperately wants to become an actor. After a mix-up with his application photograph, he's invited to a screen test in Hollywood. Once in Hollywood, at the film studios, he does everything wrong and he causes <laughs> all sorts of trouble, and like lots of things go wrong, as in the classical slapstick movies. But he falls in love with a famous actress, and eventually a studio owner recognizes him as a comic genius. 
Um, and so he kind of starts a career uh, from there in, in the movie. So the director, uh, Clyde Brookman, uh, he entered the silent movie industry as a gag director, which was a very particular function at that time. Um, he worked with Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, Lauren Hardy, and a lot of these um, um, slapstick uh, uh, were directors and actors at the same time. But because they could not direct themselves or see what the result was, they were hiring what was called a gag director. It was something that was clo closer to like a the, the, the people that were assisting clowns. It was a, a considered a very kind of technical uh, job. It was less considered as like a director in the sense of a film uh, direct, directing. It was a kind of person that helped them to kind of, um, you know, do their gags. Um, so, the picture movie Crazy was a worldwide success during the crisis times, and it was shown all over the world. And it was one of the highlights of the film, and that's where the whole controversy turns around. It's called The Magician's Code Sequence. Um, I propose that we have a look at it. It takes a, a few minutes. So we are actually now in the part of the film where he has received, by accident also, an invitation to go to, um, to, to a, a, a dinner party. And um, of this um, Kitterman, who is like a famous producer. And a lot of people go to this dinner party in order to kind of start a career or influence them to get a role in the film and so on. So by, by accident, he gets this um, invitation. the water yet? Uh, no, sir. Try it then. Slap it up. It's all ready, sir.
Where's the idea of the blowout? Oh, it's a party for the Kittum, head of the Planet Film Company. Can I help you, sir? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Whoop. <clears throat> Just a second. I'll get it. I'll get it. That's the uh, second table over, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, pardon me. Is this Miss Mercier's table? Uh, yes, but she isn't here yet. Oh, I'm glad. I was afraid I'd be the one to be late. Oh, you're with Mary? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I'm Harold Hall. Oh, Mr. Hall, uh, Mrs. Kidderman, Miss Eddie, Mr. Duray, and Mr. Clayton, and I'm Mrs. Robinson. So you're a friend of Mary Sears. She's one of the nicest girls we have. I'm very glad to know you, Mr. Hall. I suppose you're in pictures too, and with us? Oh, yes. I, I just had my first test. How nice. It's so important to get a good start. Mm -hmm. Yes. This broadcast is coming to you from the green room of the Falcon Hotel in Hollywood, California. The next number will be a special request from Mrs. Wesley Kitterman, wife of the well-known producer. All right, boys, hit it. One, two. husband, Mr. Crumplin. Mr. Mr. Crumplin. <laughs> how do you do, Mr. Hall? Uh, well, how do you do? <laughs> oh. I'm so sorry. I'll help you to clean it off, sir. 
Never mind, never mind. I got it. Say, what about my order? Uh, your wife will be here in just a moment, sir. Get him here. I want a little shit. Yes, sir. him in the face. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll teach you to play jokes on me. Hi, pal. Look who's here. Your little Margie. The dance, baby. But Mrs. Kitterman, I, I, I wouldn't do a thing like that. Yes, I think I'll get Mr. Kitterman. I don't know if I have to repeat it, but that's uh, the sequence of, it's a sequence of 
57 scenes, Harold Hall, um, sorry, having been at I can yeah, try to repeat it, but it's what we just saw. Having been admitted to the, to the party, Hall goes into the washroom. <clears throat> I still have tears in my eyes from laughing, so I have a hard time to read the, the text. Um, okay. Hall goes into the washroom and hangs his coat on a hook. His, his coat falls on the ground and just after him, a magician hangs his coat on the empty hook. Hall mistakenly puts on the magician's coat and, re and returns to the dining room. He's introduced and seated at the hostess table. Uh, later, he's dancing with her, and all sorts of incidents come out of the magician's coats, as we have seen. During the resulting melee on the dance floor, the magician enters and uh, accuses Hall for stealing his coat. I won't tell the rest of the film. I would like to move on now 10 years ahead. So in 1943, John Jobrew directed the film entitled So Is Your Uncle for Universal Pictures Incorporated. In the film, Donald Woods plays the character Steve Curtains, who starts impersonating his own uncle in order to influence his girlfriend's aunt. As the uncle, he finds himself pursued by his girlfriend's aunt, who does not approve of their relationship. So I don't know if, if this is clear, but it's, it's, it's someone who dresses up as his uncle in order to, to have a positive influence on the family uh, of his uh, girlfriend. And, but as a result, the aunt is actually in fall, falling in love with his uncle, so his impersonation of, of the uncle. And so he finds himself always like being in these uh, two roles. So Clyde Brookman worked on this film as a writer. And it was a time of, this, of the sound film where Brookman, the same director who helped Harold Lloyd to make uh, that previous scene, uh, he was asked to kind of bring in gags, but through the writing in, in the script. So Brookman, who had lost his work as a director, um, because now in the sound film, the slapstick movie was, was not there anymore, but he, he, he was uh, um, yeah, uh, kind of editing scripts and building in particular gags. And what was very common for a gag director is that they repeat gags. I mean, just as clowns, they would repeat. Um, so he often repeated the gags, which he had directed already before in silent mov movies. And so also here he recycled uh, the magician's code sequence in So Is Your Uncle. Um, I will propose to have a look at it. Um. If you don't let me have that coat, it may change the whole course of my life. No. Now listen, Joe, listen. Uh, uh, do me this one little favor and Sorry, I have to do this I'll one. let you understudy the uncle part in the play. Really? It's a promise. Oh, well, all right. Add up, boy. Uh, not mine, not mine. I'll go out and dig you one up someplace. Swell. I'll go in here and peel off the Joe. You're right there. If you don't let me have that coat, it may change the whole course of my life. No. Now listen, Joe, listen. Uh, uh, do me this one little favor and... I'll let you understudy the uncle part in the play. Really? It's a promise. Oh, well, all right. Add up, boy. Uh, not mine, not mine. I'll go out and dig you one up someplace. Swell. Sorry. I'll go in here and peel off whiskers. Be right back. So here, he was there as his uncle, but then he wanted to change back to himself, and he needs another coat. He asked for another coat. Minerva, uh, Patricia, I uh, called your home, but the butler said you were here, so I, uh, I took a chance. Well, this is Mr. Curtis's nephew, Mr. Bright. Delighted. 
Shall we dance? Uh, may I cut in? Thank you. Uh, good evening, Aunt Minerva. Uh, Patricia. Charming young man. I uh, called your home, but the butler said you were here, so I uh, I took a chance. Well, this is Mr. Curtis's nephew, Mr. Uh, Sorry, I started. Give me this one little favor, and I'll let you understudy the uncle part in the play. Really? It's a promise. Oh, well, all right. Add up, boy. Uh, not mine, not mine. I'll go out and dig you one up someplace. Swell. I'll go in here and peel off whiskers. Be right back. Good evening, Aunt Minerva. Uh, Patricia, I uh, called your home, but the butler said you were here, so I, uh, I took a chance. Well, this is Mr. Curtis's nephew, Mr. Bright. Delighted. Shall we dance? Uh, may I cut in? Thank you. Charming young man, isn't it so like his uncle? Yes, exactly like his uncle. Your uncle stepped out for a little air. I hope you don't miss him again. It's getting to be kind of a game, isn't it? Who catches who and when. Do I? Mm -hmm. The coat's a little large. I mean, I got into them uh, very hurriedly. Mr. Curtis, Mrs. Buffington. It's a pleasure, I'm sure. Uh, how's Minerva? Oh. <laughs> it is warm tonight, isn't uh, it? You must stop and say hello to her before you go. I will, darling. Goodbye. <laughs>
All right. <clears throat> so what we just saw in, the, in this sequence was Curtis goes to a nightclub disguised as his own uncle. While at the nightclub, it becomes necessary for him to appear as himself and not as his uncle. With the waiter's help, Curtis looks for a change of clothing. The waiter goes to the dressing room, takes the ma magician's coat by accident, and passes it on to Curtis. Dressed up as himself, he returns to the table. He dances with one of his table companions. An incident starts to occur from the coat, as, as we've seen. Uh, curtain leaves, and the magician blames the waiter for stealing uh, his coat. So the Harold Lloyd Corporation, and now we kind of enter in the uh, con controversy uh, that um, came about. The Harold Lloyd Corporation filed a complaint against Universal Pictures and Clyde Brookman in the United States District Court for damages, injunctive and other relief, and alleged infringement of the copyright of the motion picture entitled Movie Crazy. Both Universal and Brookman claimed that Lloyd's film is not a subject for copyright, so that slapstick is not subject for copyright. Universal asserted that there is not an appropriation of a substantial and material part of the copyrightable material, the gags and stage business of the magician's code sequence have no dramatic quality. They are subordinate sequence of events. The copyright does not cover any particular sequence, combination of gags or stage business. The scenes are merely comedian accretion to the story and have no story structure, are not dramatic, and finally they are but a mere su su subsection of, of a plot and therefore not susceptible for copyright production. That was their kind of defense. Brookman contends that the, co the comedy routine of movie crazy, mo movie crazy is not within the Copyright Act because it is a commonplace. It is dissimilar in the two pictures. It is entertainment, but not dramatic composition, and it is slapstick and not dramatic composition. Sorry, two times. That was his um, uh, argument so that it was lacking any form of dramatization or some, some kind of lit literary value as authorship was derived from uh, literature. In 1946, the court case Harold Lloyd versus Universal Pictures took place at the District Court in California, and the conclusion was unreported. Um, but here is a summary of what the judge Benjamin Harrison found. Um, and he said that Universal and Brookman knowingly, willfully, and deliberately incorporated So Is Your Uncle, uh, that's in the film So Is Your Uncle, the sequence of 57 conse consecutive se scenes uh, constituting the Magician's Code sequence, and that they lifted that directly from the movie Crazy. The trial court found that Lloyd was damaged by Universal and Brookman by a sum of $40,000 and Universal Picture, they appealed the decision. 
uh, and Harold Lloyd, he cross-appealed, meaning that he also appealed because he wanted to have more damages than this $40,000. Uh, so on May 12, 1947, the court case Harold Lloyd versus Universal Pictures took place at the United States Court of Appeals in California. And here the, the judgment um, was reported. So I propose to read some fragments um, from, from the judgment of um, Mr. Stevens. This is extremely technical, so I will try to read bit by bit, and we can kind of try to decipher it. Um, I left out, this is a, um, a legal document that contains maybe 50 pages, so I left out a lot. So it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's like little bits and fragments, and um, I will try to fill in the, the holes. So I quote the judge. We agree with the trial court that Harold Lloyd's photoplay is a dramatic work and within the meaning of Section 5 of the Copyright Act. The subjects are comedy, and while they are of the slapstick type, they nevertheless have a story to them. In the instant case, the reduction of the story, such as it is to a motion picture, is a dramatization of its work. I therefore find and rule that the copyrighted pictures in questions are within the meaning and terms of the copyright law. The first ground upon which invalidity of the copyright is based is that the photo plate in question showed works so trivial, vulgar, and of such little artistic value that they did not merit the protection of the copyright laws. As has been stated above, these pictures were shorts and the subjects were comedy, but they had a story, not of great intellectual value, to be sure, but it must be admitted they showed originality. And it has been decided that motion picture photoplays of the type here in question are entitled to protection under the provision of the Copyright Act. So maybe just to situate the, the beginning of this, uh, of his uh, judgment, so, like we're in the early uh, film time where actually there was, it was not obvious that film received a copyright protection. And if it received protection, it was more like as a theater player. So in terms of the drama, in terms of the story. So they immediately search for, for the, the, the storyline and the text or the, the writing element in the film in order uh, to protect it. And so his first stance is that Although it's like a comedian scene or slapstick, it still has a, a, a kind of storyline. But he goes on and then it will develop quite a lot. Are there any questions so far? No. So, in, his, in the second fragment, he goes on reasoning about this Section 5. Section 5 in the copyright law of 1941 at the time, um, kind of defines the, the, the various classifications that do exist or the kind of artworks that do receive protection. And he states, nor does the fact that section five above quoted of the act lists dramatic compositions and motion pictures separately imply that motion pictures are not, as suggested by Universal Pictures, dramatic compositions. Section 5 of the Copyright Act, which names 13 classes of work, of works for which copyright may be secured, stating that the application of for reg registrations shall specify to which of those classes the works belong. Section 204.4, entitled Subject Matter of Copyright, from the Code of Federal Regulations, Chapter 2, Title 37, as amended to October 1, 1941, relied upon by Universal Picture, provides, and this is a citation from the law, the designation dramatic composition does not include the following. Dances, motion picture shows, stage settings or mechanical devices by which dramatic efforts are produced or stage business, animal shows, shows sleight of hand performances, acrobatic or circus tricks of any kind, scenarios 
for or descriptions of motion pictures or the settings for the production of motion pictures, end of quote. This section is part of the description of Section 5 of the Copyright Act, which names 13 classes of, which, of works for which copyright may be secured, stating that the application for registration shall specify to which of those classes the works belong. Section 5 sets up a classification system for convenient registration in the Copyright Office when there are separate classifications for dramatic composition and motion pictures. The sequence in question consisted of, oh, sorry, I think I, I can stop here for a moment. I think there is some repetition, but basically he's trying to say that the, the, the differences of classifications are made in order, if, if an artist delivers his uh, uh, creation to the copyright office, that he has to kind of uh, go for this or that type of work. And in this case, it was classified as a motion picture, which doesn't mean that it does not receive uh, any uh, protection. So what he's trying to argue here is that even if there was little dramatic composition or a little storyline in the sequence, it would be still protected as a motion picture. And this is like the very early beginning of like recognizing um, motion pictures as such and the way that they are edited uh, and the way that, that um, one image follows another one as also a form of dramatic composition. So a way of the literary uh, book or, or kind of narrative that would underline uh, a film, it would be really looking at film as, as a dramatic composition uh, as such. I'll read the next fragment. <clears throat> He's basically kind of going over various claims that uh, Universal Pictures and Brookman did um, and trying to kind of, um, you know, um, reason his art, like come up with his argues to kind of uh, counter their claims as if the, the, the film um, by, by Harold Lloyd was only a kind of gag that could, was in the public domain. So now he goes on the, on the argument that it, they only used a small sequence of the film. The sequence in question consisted of 57 consecutive comedy scenes, or 20% of the entire future. According to the findings and the evidence, the whole sequence is intimately tied into the story and is a main source of comedy for the picture as a whole. It plays an integral and essential part in carrying along the role of the star in the story. So basically here, he kind of ignores that you know, although they use a small seg sequence, that still uh, it is an integral part of the story. Um, so he kind of rejects that that uh, element. The next uh, part, he's he says, and I quote again. The trial court found that the sequence had been copied and misappropriated by Universal Pictures, that the characters, characterization, motivation, treatment, action, and sequence of action were the same and had been deliberately and willfully copied in their picture. So is your uncle. And the evidence fully supports um, this view. A dramatic or dramatical musical composition must possess some elements of originality in order to be copyrightable. Ordinary incidents, stock situations, and oft, often told uh, tales are the common property of all playwrights. Here we find 57 consecutive scenes lifted almost bodily from the Lloyd product not just the reproduction of an isolated single incident or event, the evidence is conclusive that the lifting was deliberately intended. Mere obs observation would illustrate the resemblance without any effort of dissection. The whole picture need not to be copied to constitute infringement. The mere copying of a major sequence is sufficient. 
Universal Pictures seek to defend their action by setting out dissimilarities, changes, omissions, additions, and variations, and that there was a different locale, different actors, different characters, different dialogues, and different costumes, which were used to affect a different purpose. Slight differences and variations will not serve as a defense. It's a kind of typical um, test where they, when they compare similarities, they try to f focus on the similarities and not um, on the differences. Universal Pictures urged, urged the defense of public domain, claiming that all materials in the category may be used repeatedly without charge of infringement. In answer to the point that the sequence lifted is commonplace, we found no evidence that they had ever previously appeared in like combination, arrangement, or form. I hear like, look at the words he's using, like he, he defines film as an arrangement or as a com combination of a sequence of, of scenes, very much like dealing with the montage. The direct examination of Brookman supports this ruling. The originality was displayed in taking commonplace material and acts and making them into a new combination and novel arrangement, which is protectable by copyright. So just the fact that he translated a gag, uh, which was previously existing, towards the film um, sequencing uh, and montage made uh, this gag as something protected by co copyright. Universal's next point is that the Lloyd sequence is merely comic accretion, or consists merely of isolated gags and stage business, and the material of that description is not copyrightable. However, it has been held that such material may be so combined with events as to become subject to copyright protection. The evidence supports the conclusion apparently reached by the trial judge that an original combination of 57 sequences constituting a sequence of vital importance to the story containing characters, dialogues, and action cannot be termed merely as comedy accretion. The means of, exp of expressing an idea is subject to copyright protec protection and where one uses his own method or way of expressing his idea, such a doorman constitutes a protectable work. It is true that the mere motions, voice and postures of actors and mere stage business is not subject of copy copyright protection, but the sequence in question has liter literary quality in that it contains a story and its dramatic composition. The court found a marked similar similarity between the, the sequence in movie Crazy and So Is Your Uncle. And the sequence before us played such an important and integral part of the story. Universal uh, contends that the sequence fails to satisfy the requisite of a story. But the courts in de determining what constitute a dramatic composition have empathically stated that there must be a story, a threat of consecutive related events, either narrated or presented by di dialogue or action or both. <coughs> the sequence, as already illustrated, fulfills this requirement as found by the trial judge. The trial judge found that Brookman contributed materials to So Is Your Uncle, which was patterned after the sequence he had done in Movie Crazy, while employed by Lloyd. It was arranged at the request of Universal, and he deliberately chose material which he knew he had been used in the Lloyd picture. We are of the opinion that the trial judge properly found that a writer is liable for damages as a contributory and participating infringer and joint toward Fieser. In the instant case, Brookman received no profits, but he, 
but this does not relieve him from liability for the damages sustained by Lloyd for his deliberate misappropriation of the Lloyd's property as a writer and a director. The employer did not direct Brookman to appropriate the material from another picture, nor did he or it make the selection. Thus, he was acting entirely for his own vo volition in appropriating the material. I mean, this is a part of the comment where Brookman was trying to say that he's not responsible, that it was only the responsibility of universal uh, uh, pictures. But he, he was put um, as being part of, of it. Brookman urges the point that a motion picture is not entitled to the protection of dramatic co copyright useless, un unless, sorry, it is based upon copyrighted novel, state drama, or book, and that there is no showing in the, in the record that movie Crazy was based on a copyrighted novel, drama, or book. Here, the film itself is the subject of copyright. We hold that films which are founded upon copyrighted dramas or other dramatic compositions are protected under the provisions of Section 1 of the Copyright Act. And an unlicensed exhibition of a print of a motion picture photoplay film duly copyrighted constituted an infringement, even though the film was not founded on a copyrighted novel or dramatic composition. So here you see like this kind of, this, he's really kind of distancing the film from um, drama or like the theater uh, again. In each of its rulings, the court was supported by the law, and, and in each of its fundings, the court was supported by material and relevant evidence, substantial in character. So basically, kind of confirmed the first uh, court decision. The court affirmed the last decision and stated that Universal and Brookman copied the magician's court sequence for, uh, from movie Crazy. And after that, Brookman was fired at Universal. Brookman had a kind of, later, a, a kind of third life in television where he started to work for um, Columbia um, Television and where he kind of also continued his gags um, as, as more as a writer, but then introducing them in, in TV series. Um, but also there he kind of ended in problems because he, for him it was so evident that a gag you could repeat uh, in various versions. And eventually he actually uh, killed himself in the 50s with the, um, the gun of Buster Keaton. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very painful uh, ending of Mr. Uh, Brookman. There is actually a biography written uh, about Brookman called The Gack Man, and it's uh, written by Matthew uh, Dessen. And so if those, for those who actually want to kind of uh, learn more about, uh, about Brookman. But um, I, I leave the case uh, until here, and I uh, propose we rather kind of discuss it. Do I have to do it in English or Spanish? Oh, no, no, in Spanish, in Castilla, no. Bueno, sí. lo, lo que has presentado, ¿me oyes? Do you hear the translation? Yeah. Tengo una duda y es que eh, no he entendido muy bien en la colaboración que había entre Harold Lloyd como performer. Has dicho que siempre había una visión externa de una persona que revisaba los gags, ¿no? Entonces, con la presentación que has hecho, eh, te sientes eh, incitado a juzgar, ¿no? O sea, lo primero que sientes es que quieres establecer como un límite entre dos cosas que son parecidas, que en realidad son la misma cosa que, que fluctúa mm. de, en un momento a otro, ¿no? Sí. Yes. Eh, la tentación como artista... I mean, maybe just... 
um, the fact that it was filmed, then put live on the stage, made that they wanted to have an eye behind the camera. Yeah. So the role of Brookman was the, the man also behind the camera. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Por eso, porque lo que sucede es que eh, está claro que para crear una forma, si tú estás dentro de la creación de la forma, estás en lo que definíamos el otro día como el acto y el gesto es lo que se produce. Mm. Eh, como artista lo que más juzgaría mm. para mí, si yo fuera el juez después del caso que has puesto creo que habría también que, que castigar dos veces a Brookman una vez dándole dinero a, a Joy por robarle y otra vez habría que castigarle porque la segunda versión es mucho peor y habría que, que tener en consideración a la audiencia ¿no? de alguna manera, porque dices mm. ¿por qué la primera está tan bien y la segunda no? Eso desde la perspectiva de, no sé, del juez o algo así, ¿no? Pero lo que no tengo muy claro es que eh, en esa colaboración, eh, ¿quién crea esa, esa forma finalmente? Eso es lo que no, no, no me queda claro. Si yo fuera el juez, no me queda claro. Necesitaría saber quién viene con el gag, quién lo pule, dónde se genera esa, esa forma que después puede ser viral como transmitida en el tiempo. Es... Mm. Si sabes algo más de esa relación mm. metodológica o de proceso. The work of Brookman, but in the first case, and that's maybe also interesting, I think, to look at in terms of the working conditions that had changed in Hollywood, is that Lloyd, he was, he was the producer of his own film. Okay. So he was the actor the director and the producer, he was holding the rights. So he had a Harold Lloyd Corporation, which was very exceptional. You know, later the, the, the big studios took over and it was universal. Um, so, but both works were done by Brookman, but he was first working for Harold Lloyd and then later he was working for Universal. Um, so in a way he was, he considered that he was using his own work. <laughs> And within the tradition of, of within clowning, where in clowning a gag is not, I mean, it's in, it's in the public domain, it's, it, can, it can be repeated. And a lot of the um, practice of clowning is all about timing. It's about your sensibility also in relation to an audi audience, like w when, you know, and that all the, ref the refinement in the practice of clowning was actually on that level, not on the level of like uh, editing or you know um, other other things. Um, maybe I, so I have to talk a little bit about the specific ecology of clowning because what is interesting about clowning is that y you you cannot be a clown. It's almost like a verb, in the sense that you can be a magician and do it in a clowny way, or you can ride a bike and do it in a clowny way, or you can give a lecture and do it in a clowny way, but you can never be a clown as such. It's always attached uh, to doing something, which is, I think, also interesting uh, and typical to that ecolo ecology of how, how a clown uh, functions. Because when we invoked this case in a kind of assembly format, we invited the clown to be present. And you cannot just ask a clown to be a clown. I mean, he is either doing something else, <clears throat> meaning he is not the clown, or, but he's clowning, or you know, he's there as, as a non-clown. Um, anyway, that's just a, a, a side comment. Yo también quería... O sea, me he quedado con esa, con esa duda de la, de la autoría ¿no? y, y realmente con la conclusión de, del caso lo que ves es que eh, eh, la autoría al final se fija, ¿no? se fija pero se fija en, un, en, en, en las compañías en las, en, en, en las empresas y entonces confunde a la, o sea ya no se sabe realmente o sea se pierde la, eh, a Brookman como autor de, de su propio trabajo ¿no? Pero lo que también me ha llamado la atención la idea de, de, de que una de las claves en el, en el uno de los argumentos del, del juicio es que es eh, 
no sé si lo he entendido bien, pero que realmente lo que concede a la secuencia, el estatus de secuencia original, no son los gestos aislados, sino la cadena de gestos, ¿no? Y ahí vamos de nuevo a, a, a la eh, conferencia de Sven y a, a también una de las, o sea, de las uh -huh. eh, preguntas que se hizo en el público de determinar uh -huh. eh, dónde empieza y dónde acaba un gesto. ¿no? Y creo que este es un, un caso interesante en relación a, a la idea también del gesto y de su continuidad, porque... Uh -huh. No sé qué hubiera sucedido si hubiera sido solamente uno de los, de los, de los gestos, ¿no? de, de, de la paloma solo, ¿no? si solo hubiera habido la paloma. Pero claro, era la cadena y la, y la secuencia y el orden de eh, todos los, los, los gestos de gags, bueno, todos los gags. No sé si esto eh, lo has pensado también o... Mm. I mean, I think today the decision would probably be very different because dance has a protection and I think even circus, certain circus acts would be considered protectable. I mean, the whole authorship law developed on protecting writers and then was kind of um, applied onto other practices as if they were all the same. I mean, in a way, authorship is trying to create one ecology that should work for all possible uh, practices. But what is interesting here, and I think in the beginning of Hollywood cinema, where actually it's so close to clowning with the slapstick movie, and it's so close to gesture and all kind of other things, that you see how the, the, the power of the writer, um, true authorship, is kind of brought in you know, from the beginning. And also in this movement from silent film to sound film, how actually the, 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 the writing and the narrative becomes like extremely uh, important like and it just the the i mean i don't have to explain it i think that the, the classical hollywood um, um, working relationship it's very like a pyramid the producer he holds all the rights although he's actually not doing that much uh, on 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 the film itself in the sense of you know directing the images or holding the camera uh, and and so on and in a way it's a very um pyramid like every every worker uh, has maybe some of the rights for what they contribute to the film but at the end for the film as such it's the producer who holds all the rights plus in the US there is this it's a kind of um, typical thing it's called works for hire so if you actually if you are working for a boss you also lose um, your authorships because you're under the directions of someone else who kind of define what, what you're doing. So as an employee, also you, you lose the rights uh, if you are fall under this works for hire um, system, which is different for freelancers um, somehow because they often keep then a kind of rights over the little contribution that they have added, you know, if there is some kind of originality uh, included uh, to it. I also, But, sorry. Mm, yeah. No, I was just, was just wanted to add that I also see a connection to uh, Kojo's talk in a way. There are lots of interconnections between the various contributions in that what we see here is also the rise of corporate personhood and corporate authorship, mm -hmm. right? The, the corporate person as, as author, Harold Lloyd, the corporation, rather than um, mm -hmm. Harold Lloyd, the individual or the subject. Yeah, yeah. And the actor. And, yeah. Yeah. But it was exceptional that he was, I think he was actor, so he was still a body, but he was incorporated at the same time. Yeah, the, the and that's bodies, why... Yeah, the two that bodies was, of Harold Bob. Yeah, and he could only do these trials because he was the incorporated yeah. one. Yeah. And taking big studios like Universal in front uh, of the court, and obviously Universal is complete, there you have the division, I mean, there it's just only incorporated. Um, but, yeah, just through this Brockman figure who kind of connected the two Um, yeah, it it talks a lot about how the working conditions, I think, changed in Hollywood. Maybe I have to say that just before this court case, there was a very similar court case. It also involved Brookman and a, another recycling of a gag uh, film. And there Lloyd had lost the case because they said that this gag didn't add much to the narrative of the film. So they actually allowed him to lift it out 
And the fact that he had won this case, he thought he, was, had, he had his hands free, he could kind of endlessly do this. And here actually Lloyd tried again, um, and like by bringing the, the gag more into the narrative, allowed him actually to win this particular um, uh, case. So it, it, it was part of a series of trials that Lloyd initiated against the big uh, studios. Uh, I just wanted to say now in English, uh, in relation to what you said, Sven said, that the consequence of the of the trial is that the Brookman is fired by the company, so he gets the incom incorporated. So disincorporated. <laughs> but it was a part. I mean, it was just a result of the legal decision. If the legal decision would have been different, he would have been you know, continue the job as he was doing it. Okay, sorry, can I just ask this just as a, as a, as a basic question? Basically, wasn't, wasn't this pretty much all that uh, the Harold Lloyd Corporation was doing at this stage? Basically, indeed, uh, filing uh, lawsuits? I mean, they were, to what extent was, you know, this Harold Lloyd Corporation still an active player in the film business by the 1940s? I mean, was this actually basically their day job, suing mm. and... Or <laughs> I think he and also Buster Keaton, they yeah. kind of had to reinvent themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that was one way yeah. of maintaining yeah. a kind of, you know, yeah. uh, power position yeah. within yeah. this uh, yeah. Hollywood world. I think Bus yeah. Buster Keaton, eventually he was hired. Buster Keaton did become yeah. a gag man, basically, and yeah. he got one of his uh, final uh, acting roles in the sort of musical comedy uh, in the good old summertime with Judy Garland in the late 40s. He got this role because he was a gag man, but he devised a gag routine where someone would fall with a violin and crush the violin, but mm -hmm. only he could do it. He devised the routine and only he could really do it brilliantly and in a funny way. So he actually got the part, you know, that he had written. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't mean to write it for himself, but he was the only one who actually um, was up to it. Thank you.